Hi, I'm Luke Boserman, the blogger behind the Weekly Holler. With Valentine's Day coming up soon, I knew I had to find a special story for this week. And I think I found just the one. In the late 1800s, Mary Hartwell Catherwood, an author from Ohio, visited Mackinac Island in Lake Huron. While there, Catherwood met an old man named Ignace Pelot, the son of a Chippewa mother and a French-Canadian father who told her this story. She eventually published it in her book, Mackinac and Lake Stories, in 1899. As a young man, Ignace had a birch dog sled that he used to carry mail over the ice of Lake Huron in the winter. He was a tall fellow in those days, not afraid of anything. He could swim, run on snowshoes, and go without eating for two or three days if he had to. Sometimes in the spring, when the ice broke up, Ignace would get stuck on an ice floe and would be carried for miles out in the lake. It didn't matter to him. He was familiar with the currents of the water and knew he'd eventually make it to shore. One day in March, Ignace was bringing a load of mail to Mackinac Island. The wind had turned from east to west in the morning, and Ignace knew that he wouldn't be able to travel over the ice for much longer. The ice always went to pieces quickly when the March wind turned. When he arrived at Mackinac Island, people crowded about to get their letters. He saw a pretty young woman in the crowd. Her name was Miss Rosalind. Ignace could see that Rosalind was quite distraught. She wanted to go to Sheboygan because her sister who lived there was sick. Everyone on Mackinac told her that it was too late to cross the ice. The strait was dangerous. Ignace heard Miss Rosalind tell her friend that if no one would take her, she would make the trip herself. With her sister being sick, she was determined to go. When her friend tried to dissuade her, it only made Rosalind cry. Rosalind ran home, made a little bundle in the house, and came out, ready to walk over the ice to Sheboygan. No one could stop her. Ignace watched, and as Rosalind stepped out onto the ice, he thought he had never seen a woman so beautiful. In that moment, Ignace lost every bit of sense he had. He forgot that his mother, his younger brothers and sisters, all depended on him to provide for the family. He forgot that the ice was melting and that his dogs were already tired. Ignace ran to Rosalind, took off his cap, and offered to take her to Sheboygan and his dog sled. Rosalind thanked Ignace, and as he looked into her big dark eyes, Ignace had never felt more ready to cross the strait. The people on the shore cheered, though some called out warnings to the pair. They set out across the frozen lake. It wasn't long before they came to a wide crack in the ice. Ignaz held his breath as the dog scurried across. The ice groaned and the sledge left water-filled tracks, but the sun was already far down in the southwest. The wind will grow colder. The real thaw will not come before tomorrow, Ignaz thought. They traveled between the east side of Round Island and Boy Blank Island. Ignaz kept his eyes fixed on the course to Sheboygan. The sweat dripped off his face in spite of the chill wind he felt through his clothes. There was an Indian burying ground on the open land above the beach on that side of Round Island. Ignace looked up as they passed it. The sunset normally showed through there, but what he saw was a skeleton. It looked like it was sliding downhill from the graveyard to the beach. It didn't move. The earth was washed from it and it hung there staring back at Ignace. Being the son of a Chippewa woman, Ignace felt pity for the skeleton, lying there exposed to the elements. He made a mental note to return after he got back from Sheboygan to bury it. He cracked the whip to drive the dogs forward, but something inside him pulled him toward the skeleton on the island. I cannot go on, he said to himself, but the ground was frozen. How could he cover up that skeleton without a shovel or even a hatchet to break the earth? But nevertheless, something pulled him toward the bones, so he stopped and the dogs turned and dragged the sledge up to the beach of Round Island. Ignace told Rosalind that he had to cut a stick to mend his whip, thinking that if he was able to get a stick, maybe he could rake some dirt over the skeleton and return on a different day to dig it a proper grave. The dogs laid down, panting. Rosalind looked at Ignace with her big brown eyes and begged him to hurry. Suddenly they heard the roar of breaking ice. Ignace looked back toward Mackinac. The channel they had just crossed seemed to be moving. He crossed himself, knowing why he felt the pull to bring the dog sled to the beach. He felt gratitude for the skeleton who slid downhill to warn him. Rosalind was distraught at the idea of being stranded on Round Island. 
Inyas tried to comfort her, but she continued to cry, saying that she wished he would just leave her alone. So he decided to gather wood for a fire. Inyas ran along the beach to check on the skeleton first. He looked and looked, but try as he might, he couldn't find the skeleton anywhere. As strange as that was, he didn't have time to be scared over disappearing skeletons. Miss Rosalind needed a camp and a place to sleep. Every man used to dog sledding always carried his tinder box, his knife, and his tobacco. But Inyas had more than that. He had left Mackinac so quickly, he'd forgotten to take out the storekeeper's bacon that lined the bottom of the sled. They had plenty of meat. Inyas made a fire of driftwood. He cut a tunnel in some brush and spread a fur on the ground there to create a private place for Miss Rosalind to sleep. Then he unloaded the bacon and put slices of it on long sticks. The bacon sizzled while it roasted. The dogs came close, blinking in the light of the fire, and licked their chops. The smell of the cooking bacon cheered Rosalind. They filled their bellies with toasted meat, tossed the scraps to the dogs, then walked together to the water's edge and drank with their hands. When they returned to the fire, Inyas found himself wishing that he had brought his fiddle. Being alone with this beautiful woman made him want to sing. Rosalind smiled at him, then turned her gaze towards Mackinac. Inyas assured her that a boat would come by soon to rescue them. After a while, Rosalind told Inyas that she was exhausted and retired to the tunnel bed that he'd made for her. As Inyas watched her settle in, his heart filled with joy. He was guarding the most beautiful woman he'd ever seen, right here in his camp. But what was that sound? Was Rosalind crying again? His heart sank. Maybe she wasn't crying because her sister was sick, or because of the ice breakup, or the cold. Maybe she felt ashamed to be in prison on this island with a man. The very thought made Inyas want to throw himself in the lake. Inyas's favorite dog, Old Sauvage, came over and laid his head on his master's knee. Inyas scratched him between the ears and gazed into the flames. He'd never had the chance to court a young woman because he'd been too busy taking care of his mother and younger siblings. He wished that he could have met Miss Rosalind under better circumstances. Suddenly, Old Sauvage stood up. He turned in the direction of Rosalind's tunnel bed and barked, his hair bristling. Rosalind screamed and ran out of her tunnel bed toward the fire. Behind her in the darkness, Inyas saw the glint of green eyes. What happened next seemed like a whirlwind of teeth, fur, claws, and fangs. With a howl, Old Sauvage darted toward the creature. Inyas pulled out his knife and dove after his dog. Sauvage fought the creature, tooth and nail. Inyas darted in and struck once, twice, three times with his knife. The creature fell dead on the ground, a massive wildcat. Sauvage's neck was clamped between the predator's jaws. The old dog had given his life to protect his master. Inyas knelt over his faithful dog with a heavy heart. But before he could shed a tear, Miss Rosalind rushed forward, threw her arms around his neck, and kissed him. A boat collected Inyas and Rosalind from Round Island two days later. Three years after their rescue, they were married. For the rest of his life, Inyas stopped to cross himself every time he passed the Indian burial ground on Round Island. He never saw the skeleton again. His and Rosalind's versions of the story are nearly identical, with the exception of one detail. Rosalind denies ever kissing Inyas on that fateful night. I hope you enjoyed this story. For more like it, check out theweeklyholler.com and sign up for our email newsletter. You can also follow The Weekly Holler on Facebook and YouTube. Hi guys, Luke here from the Weekly Holler. I really hope you enjoyed the skeleton of Round Island, our story this week. I just wanted to take a minute and show you the official Weekly Holler t-shirt. That's what I've got on here. You can see our logo with our mascot here, George Jones, the possum. Stay tuned because next week, I'm gonna be telling you guys how you can get your hands on one of these. All right. Take care and uh, see you next week.